Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. AHS announces that more family physicians are moving to Lethbridge to deal with the doctor shortage. We have the numbers as to how many. With more viruses arriving in southwestern Alberta, our region's lead medical officer of health has tips on how to best protect yourself and your family. And Team Canada won gold at the World Junior Hockey Championship in Halifax. We have reaction from some of the players. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Our country is enjoying a golden glow. Team Canada won gold by beating Chechia 3-2 in overtime at the World Junior Hockey Championship on Thursday night. Canada's gone back-to-back, -back also winning the tournament last year. The players said winning gold this year was an incredible experience. You know, what was said was, you know, we have a chance to go win a gold medal. If, uh, you know, we were, we were given the situation at the start of the tournament, we had, you know, one chance to, one goal to win a gold medal, you know, we would take that. So, uh, we wanted to go out and, and uh, you know, just, just enjoy it and just, you know, play our game, just be ourselves and, and play hockey and, uh, you know, let rest take care of itself. Best feeling in the world. That's the uh, best way I can describe it. Uh, couldn't be more proud of those guys. Couldn't be more proud of that group. And, um, yeah, just, just so happy, so excited. And, uh, yeah, just so proud of those guys. We're pretty pumped. It's, uh, it's obviously a dream come true to you know we won in the summer obviously but uh, to get it again is unbelievable in 20 years we're gonna look at uh, you know our gold medal we're not gonna go look at stats or anything we're gonna uh, you know appreciate what what we did together and um, you know that's what that's what matters you come here and um, you know if I had a, a good tournament or anyone had a good tournament and we lost it uh, you know no one no one really uh, cared too much I think you, you want to win that gold medal and that's all that matters it means everything I mean even to win you know you never know when you're gonna get the opportunity to win again and uh, uh, to be here with this team and you know it uh, could have ended better it was uh, unbelievable I remember I didn't throw my gloves off right away I uh, <laughs> almost forgot it was like overtime do or die and, uh, and then I see Wazi threw his stuff off so uh, nice play by Clarkie two on one nice pass and uh, yeah I just had to get over the pad you know the people from the outside they think well you know look at their team you know they should have won but I mean when you're in that room you know how hard it is to win at anything and I think how resilient we were and we lost the first First game to those guys, and I think we just played. Uh, we played as one the rest of the tournament, and eventually uh, came out on top. Very cool. Congrats again to Team Canada. The Lethbridge Sport Council and Tourism Lethbridge are joining forces to bring forth more resources to support sport tourism development. Now, last year, the Tim Hortons Briar generated 16.8 million dollars of economic activity to our region. Staff from the Lethbridge Sport Council say this partnership will be mutually beneficial. One of the roles that Sport Council will have is to be that liaison between uh, an event right holder, so a national sport organization, talk to them, gather information, see if they're interested in Lethbridge. And if it's a fit with an event that they have, then talk to the local sport organization who may be the host of that event or the facility to say, it, does this align with your vision of what you want to do and gather more information about their organization, their capacity, um, and help them understand what the process is if they wanted to host an event. By the way, the Tim Hortons Briar supported 137 jobs, totaling $6.2 million in wages and salaries. That included $5.4 million in wages and salaries for the local economy. Well, it appears as though the cold and flu season is in full force once again. Not only are many of us dealing with COVID-19, but also the flu and the RSV virus. The Chinook Regional Hospital's ICU capacity is close to 100% right now. Dr. Vivian Satorp is the lead medical officer of health for the South Zone with Alberta Health Services, and she joins us now here in Lethbridge. Dr. Satorp, when it comes to protecting ourselves from these viruses, is it best to just continue with a common sense approach? What's often termed the triple threat, the three viruses that you indicated, the preventive strategies are all very similar, which is great news for all of us. Um, some of the prevention strategies are one, and is to stay home. Stay home if you're sick, keep your kids home when they're sick. School is starting up again next week, so that's a very important measure. Secondly, there's immunization and for influenza as well as the COVID. And even better news is that the influenza vaccine is a good match to the main dominant strain that is currently circulating of the influenza A, H3, N2. 
And thirdly, good hand hygiene as always, covering your cough if you have to get out of your, uh, your house. Um, and then there are other options that we've seen that have worked very well throughout the pandemic as well. So, um, and if you choose to wear a mask, uh, feel free to do so. If you choose to avoid very large gatherings, that is an other uh, option for individuals. So there's a whole toolkit of preventive strategies for uh, families and individuals. Now, is there any way we can attack these viruses with medication or do we just kind of ride them out with our immune systems? Primarily with viral illnesses, it's supportive treatment. So riding it out, lots of fluids, uh, managing fever, etc., and rest. Um, there are individuals who may be eligible for early treatment for influenza and COVID as examples. And those are especially individuals with underlying chronic conditions such as COPD, lung conditions, asthma, et cetera. And in those situations, and if people are feeling uh, unwell, is to seek medical attention. Thanks so much for your time, Dr. Vivian Sator. By the way, as for the doctor shortage in our region, AHS says 17 family physicians have committed to Lethbridge. Four are already practicing medicine here in our city with the hope that the two more will begin later this month. Five will arrive between February and April and the final six between May and July. You know, when it comes to medicine, there are those who support Western medicine, but there are others in the healthcare industry who believe in what the East brings to the table. Brian Roberge is a registered nurse who also believes in the holistic approach when it comes to medicine. She says there's no reason why both Western and Eastern medicine cannot coexist and support each other. Now, when we're talking about Western medicine, I mean, myself and the other nurses on our team by no means think that Western medicine is an issue. Western medicine is innovative and amazing and definitely helps save lives. I mean, if we get in a car accident or have a heart attack or cut our arm off, we're not going to rub some herbs on it and hope that it heals. We definitely need Western medicine in these times. But with that being said, we are taking too much of a reactive approach to health, and we need to turn towards more preventative, holistic means to be able to help individuals both avoid disease and then when it's presented, be able to heal and that means as well. Make sure you catch the entire interview with Holistic RN Brian Roberge and BCN's Naveen Day coming up in the second half of our program. Buffalo Bill safety Damar Hamlin continues to make what doctors describe as a remarkable recovery. Four days after going into cardiac arrest and being resuscitated on the field, his agent says Hamlin is now breathing on his own and able to talk. The Bill say Hamlin even joined a team meeting this morning on FaceTime telling his teammates that he loved them. In a statement, the team says Hamlin's neurological function remains intact. That is great news. Also great news about our weather here in southwestern Alberta today. So nice and mild for this time of year. Jeanette Roche is in now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, it looks like we'll be well above our seasonal values as we head into the weekend. Well, we sure will be, Hal. Uh, we're looking at plus digits all across the board all the way into next week. And it's all thanks to those warm Chinook winds, which will be coming and blowing away all the snow and the ice. I know I, for one, am looking forward to having that ice gone from the parking lot. It's been a little treacherous out there. But uh, speaking of those winds, they're going to be gusting up to 50K overnight and into 40 kilometers per hour tomorrow on Saturday. Not horrible, considering what it's bringing with it. Look at these temperatures even the overnight low minus five uh, up to six degrees on Saturday and next week much of the same I'll be back later on in the show to give you that seven day forecast looking forward to it. thanks so much Jeanette Christmas begins on Saturday for Ukrainians and Ukrainian families who have settled into our city will be celebrating a Ukrainian family opened up their home on Friday to showcase some traditional food from their country as BCN's Micah Quinn explains now, the Rotary Club of Lethbridge was instrumental in helping close to 20 Ukrainian families get situated here in our city. A Ukrainian home was full of Christmas cheer on Friday morning as families were in the festive spirit gearing up to celebrate their holiday season on January 7th. For new Ukrainians in our city, they say they're just happy to be here after escaping the war against Russia and are thankful for the warmness that Lethbridge residents have shown them. We feel like home because it's not easy to celebrate Christmas 
it, it's our first Christmas in Canada. We left our relatives, uh, our parents, our brothers, sisters. Traditional Ukrainian dishes were also prepared to showcase the wonderful delicacies of the country. The Rotary Club of Lethbridge connected with Lethbridge Family Services to figure out which families they could help. The club was able to raise just under $50,000 to assist 18 Ukrainian families and four single adults. The group's goal is to help Ukrainians find housing, furniture, clothing, food, and other essential items once they get to Lethbridge. You know, there's a total of 16,000 Ukrainians in Alberta and approximately 200 in Lethbridge. And that was updated with Lethbridge Family Service. We've touched probably 100 of those. I think my understanding is that there'll be more of this second wave coming. Ukrainian Christmas will officially end with the Feast of Epiphany on January 19th. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. You know, due to inflation, dining out is getting to be pretty expensive. This is not only having an effect on individuals, but also on restaurants. Vicki Vandenhoek, owner and operator of Honkers Pub and Eatery here in Lethbridge, says business has partially slowed down because of the high costs she's incurred. Sort of the chatter is that they're being more selective. Um, they're being more selective the number of times they go out to eat uh, because just the fact that, you know, eating out in public is more expensive than eating at home. Um, that's always been the case. So they're maybe not treating themselves as well. Um, we still find, like, the worker who is, um, you know, on lunch budgets and stuff like that, they're, they're still coming out to do it. Um, but I, we're finding the nighttime crowd is slower um, just because, A, we're in January, but B, because of the inflation. Vandenhoek says when it comes to tracking down certain products for food, they've also been impacted by supply chain issues. Thanks to an initiative from the federal government, $400 million will be invested into the local community foundations, Red Crosses, and United Ways across Canada. Charlene Davidson, Executive Director of the Community Foundation of Lethbridge, explains what the support from the Community Services Recovery Fund will be going towards. These funds are to help the charitable sector recover as we come out of the uh, COVID pandemic and move forward. It is money to help the organizations strengthen their internal programs and systems and invest in their people. Between the local community foundation and the local United Way, we're receiving just under a million dollars in our community, which is fantastic. We've come through a really difficult year in the charitable sector. Donations were down for a lot of groups. Some of the charities have had to close their doors, and this money is intended to help those charities strengthen, support, and build so that they're stronger as we move forward as a community. Jackie Zalasak with United Way says they're simply thrilled to be able to help charities move forward in expanding their programs and services thanks to this new funding. We are here to um, help these organizations in conjunction with the Community Foundation um, as well as the Red Cross um, and moving forwards in, in um, supporting these organizations redesign their, their programs and invest in their people. And we're so thankful that the Government of Canada is in, has been able to um, allow us to support these organizations in moving forwards in 2023. The Community Foundation will have over $500,000, while the United Way will receive over $400,000 to help support local charities. Award-winning Canadian country music artist Corb Lund is a very proud Albertan. He's also someone who's not a fan of coal mining in the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies. Lund says the issue was first brought to his attention by Alberta ranchers. He says when it comes to coal mining, the return on investment doesn't appear to be there for most Albertans. And I always address this topic by saying, number one, I'm not against resource extraction. It's just that this is a terrible idea. And number two, I'm not political. I don't like any of the parties, so this has nothing to do with politics for me. I would say the same thing no matter who is trying to pull it. But, yeah, it makes no sense for Albertans. Like, the, all we're getting, the, the royalty rate is very, very small, and all the companies are foreign, and it's going to ruin the water, it's going to ruin the Old Man River, and it's going to ruin the Rockies. And we don't get anything out of it other than a few hundred jobs per mine, which have to be balanced against ag jobs and tourism jobs, not to mention the cleanup, which, no matter what they say, the taxpayer will foot the bill for. We know this. This is just, that's an old playbook, so. Corb Lund will also chat about some of his very special memories with his friend and legendary singer Ian Tyson, who passed away recently. That Q&A with Jeanette Roche is coming up after business news. Some of Canada's largest police unions are joining forces to identify why five police officers have been killed in the past four months. The group say they will review judicial and public policy frameworks, including bail and sentencing practices. 
They will also look into what they call a growing and chronic shortage of officers. They then plan to call for change to make sure that the wave of violence against police does not continue. The four associations involved represent around 60,000 police personnel. Multiple people were wounded on Thursday night following a shooting outside of a restaurant in South Florida. Social media posts said a music video was being filmed at the time of the incident. It was an altercation that uh, led to the finger licking location. An altercation that led to the finger licking location. Um, uh, there were some shots being fired and multiple victims um, were injured. Inside the restaurant, outside? Outside the restaurant. I heard the gunshots. It was uh, sporadic gunshots. Uh, I think it was uh, at, least, at least 12 shots. Very sporadic 12 shots. At this time, we don't know. We don't have a number. We've there were multiple uh, victims. We've heard as many as 10. I cannot confirm that. Right now, it's just multiple victims that were injured. Meanwhile, in Mexico, the operation to detain Ovidio Guzman, son of imprisoned drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, unleashed a running firefight in the northern city of Culiacan. The battle killed 10 military personnel and 10 suspected members of the Sinaloa drug cartel. Mexican authorities say they were still able to fly Guzman to Mexico City despite the efforts of the cartel. He was taken to the officer of the Attorney General's Organized Crime Special Prosecutor and then later transported to a maximum security prison. The Operation Christmas Child campaign was another huge success for Samaritan's Purse this year. It helped provide for many children around the globe with school supplies and personal hygiene items. As we hear in this next report, the shoeboxes even made their way to Fiji this year. Ravina Kumar and her team with Operation Christmas Child have the details. A lot of people, when they think of Fiji, the first word that comes is that it's a paradise. I want to go there. Some of them have said, this is my bucket list to get there. Fiji, it's a paradise with the lovely beaches, friendly people all around. Yes, Fiji is a paradise, but weather plays up a lot. There's a lot of storms here. There's a lot of rains here. It really floods a lot from November to April here in Fiji. The floodwaters went through my house twice. After the first one, I do my cleanup, try to bring my family back home, and the second flood came in. And during this flood, most of the children, they are being affected. Sometimes their school books, school bags, food in their house is being washed away. Rain becomes an obstacle, but it also gives us an opportunity to see what else God can do. When our containers come in, it's always come in a very challenging time for us, especially if it's a, it's a cyclone season, it's a rainy season. And so our boys work so hard to get all these boxes out of the container in time. All these changing of weather does not slow down the work of Operation Christmas Child in Fiji. Rhino shine, blood, cyclone, but ministry has to move on. And so this Operation Christmas Child Ministry, national team, regional team, we push through it. Sometimes we have to go in the weather to reach out to those children. Operation Christmas Child motivates us to push through for us to reach out for the unreached, especially the children. And what we are doing about it is to go through any challenge that comes across and grab every opportunity and open doors that open for us. And above all, the gospel message. It is so wonderful to see the beautiful looks on the kids' faces. And wonderful to feel the warm Chinook winds we've been experiencing here in Lethbridge. You know, not a bad weekend is shaping up with warmer temperatures. A full look at the weather picture is on deck. You know, when you live in southern Alberta, it's so nice to get a reprieve from the cold winter temperatures each time a Chinook makes its way over the Rockies. Jeanette Roche is in now with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, it appears as though those Chinook winds will be sticking around for quite some time. 
Yes, they sure will be, Hal, at least for the next week. And of course, that does mean those warmer temperatures. And look at these warm temperatures. We're seeing all plus degrees all the way across the board for the whole week. Uh, six lots, we're seeing lots of sixes in there. So six degrees right through the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, with mainly sunny skies. Clear skies also expected on Monday with high all the way up to seven degrees. Back to six degrees for Tuesday and Wednesday. And then all the way up to nine degrees for next Thursday. I'm absolutely loving those temperatures especially when you consider that the average high for this time of year is minus two right there average low for this time of year minus 14 so we're well above that 13 that was where we were sitting though back in 2003 so it must have been a chinooky day that day as well minus 35 uh, was our chilly low back in 1996 sun rose this morning at 8 28 and our sunset this evening at 4 47 giving us eight hours and 19 minutes of a day Daylight. Okay, so let's take a look at the highs across the nation. Starting in Victoria, looking at a high of 8 degrees tomorrow, 40% chance of showers, looking at 40 to 60K winds in the morning, but it should be lightening up by the afternoon. 9 degrees the high tomorrow in Vancouver, 70% chance of showers and about 60K winds along the water there. Minus 1 the high in Edmonton tomorrow and 2 degrees the high in Calgary with mainly sunny skies. So um, the prairie's definitely warming up quite a bit as well here. Minus 5 the high in Saskatoon tomorrow with mainly sunny skies. Clear skies also expected in Regina tomorrow with minus three. Both of those cities also looking at fog dissipating in the morning and Winnipeg looking at partly cloudy skies. Mainly overcast skies though in both Toronto and Ottawa tomorrow. Three the high in Toronto, minus four in Ottawa. Zero the high in Montreal with partly cloudy skies there. Quite a bit of precipitation, lots of snow expected tomorrow in Atlantic Canada looking at 30% chance of flurries in Fredericton. Zero the high there, two the high in Halifax with periods of snow. 60% chance of flurries in Charlottetown tomorrow with a high of zero. We're also looking at a 60% chance of flurries in St. John's and also two centimeters of snow along that southern coast there with a high of minus one. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. Stats Canada says the economy added 104,000 jobs in December as the unemployment rate fell slightly to 5%. Economists say the report was a bit of a surprise, noting that wages were also up around 5.1% last month compared to a year ago. They say both figures are consistent with a healthy and robust job market. BMO had predicted a gain of 10,000 jobs in December and for the unemployment rate to hold steady. As for Alberta, government officials say we gained more than 41,000 full-time jobs in December and 94,000 jobs overall in 2022. Jobs Minister Brian Jean says most of the growth came from the private sector with major gains in construction, manufacturing, technology, business and health care. Stats Canada also says Canadian women were employed in record numbers last year. According to Canada's Labour Force survey, 81% of women aged 25 to 54 were employed on average over the course of 2022. That is the highest annual rate on record since 1976. The workforce participation rate for women was 1.3% higher than what was reported back in 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic set in. There was also a jump in employment involving mothers with kids under the age of six. In 2022, just over 75% of working age women with young children were working. That's an increase of 3.3 percentage points from 2019. Consumer insolvencies in Canada were up 16.3% in November compared with the same month in 2021. That is the highest level since the start of the pandemic. According to insolvency firm Bromwich & Smith, business insolvencies were up 58.3% from November of 2021 with total insolvencies growing by 17.5%. The report also said that insolvencies did drop during the pandemic as emergency aid helped to support both individuals and businesses. Sadly, when the support came to an end, along with high inflation, insolvencies went up. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 307 points on the day to finish at 19,814. The Dow was up 700 points to 33,630. The S&P 500 was up 86 on the day to 38.95, and the Nasdaq was up 264 points to 10,569. 
West Texas Intermediate Oil was up six cents to 73.73 US per barrel. Natural gas was up four cents to 376 US. Gold was up 32.81 to 1865.69 US an ounce. And silver was up 59 cents to 23.83 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $12.11 per bushel. Barley's at 965. Canola's at 1975 and corn is at $11.32 per bushel. Live cattle February contract was down 58 cents to 156.78. Feeder cattle January contract was down $1.10 to 182.70. And lean hogs February contract was down 225 to 8028. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 74.38 US. Recapping one of our top stories, in response to the doctor shortage here in Lethbridge, Alberta Health Services says 17 family physicians have committed to our city. Four are already practicing medicine in Lethbridge with the hope that two more will begin later this month. Five will arrive between February and April and the final six between May and July. There appears to be more in the healthcare field who believe that you can combine Western and Eastern medicine, especially if you incorporate a preventative holistic approach. Registered nurse Brian Roberge will share details shortly with BCN's Naveen Day and the rest of us. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Alberta does not have a health care system so much as it has a sick care system. That is according to Brian Roberge. She is a registered nurse, holistic health coach, and the founder of the Holistic RN and Company, which is based in Stony Plain, Alberta. She joins us now via Zoom to talk more about alternative approaches to taking care of our health and how her company helps others to do so. Brian, welcome to Bridge City News. Thank you so much for having me. So, Brian, tell us, why did you start the Holistic RN and Company and what kind of need were you seeing? Thank you so much. So the Holistic RNA Company was actually born about six years ago, and it actually started under a different name at the time, and it was just me on the company itself. And this actually ended up happening after I experienced my own health crisis and felt that I wasn't being as supported from our Western medicine practitioners as I had hoped. Now, I had actually just completed nursing school and was actually working in bedside nursing myself at the time. And I had been going from doctor's appointment to doctor's appointment, trying to get answers in regards to the symptoms that I was experiencing. And unfortunately, it took quite a few years before I actually ended up being diagnosed with what ended up being celiac disease. Now, this kind of sparked an interest in terms of nutrition and understanding what exactly the body ends up doing with the food that we bring in. And from that, I ended up enrolling in multiple courses, certifications, and trying to understand this holistic side or this nutrition side a little bit deeper. And in regards to that, I really started to explore how much of an impact different things that we do can actually result in other health crises later on. And in terms of nutrition, just to give you a little bit of an insight, in our four years of a nursing degree, or at least in my education, I only received a half an hour on what nutrition was. It taught me what oh, a protein wow. was, a carb was, a fat was, and that was it. So there really isn't much education that's provided in our actual degrees in regards to how much this can impact the body. Moving forward over the years, I started to realize that Western medicine and what we are trying to achieve is unfortunately putting a Band-Aid approach on a lot of what we're doing. And we're trying to heal individuals by fixing the symptom and not actually fixing the root cause of that problem itself. So over the years, I've been working really hard to help individuals and clients come through who are seeking alternative therapies or alternative ways of looking at their health and actually healing that root cause and figuring out what is behind that illness or that condition or that disease that they are presented with and helping them actually resolve that or at least reduce that to the point where they're able to live a normal life without a prescription medication. So when we talk about the spectrum of Western medicine and holistic medicine, um, are the services and advice your company offers intended to be a supplement to modern medicine or an alternative to it? 
Great question. So this is actually one of my favorites to answer. So just to give you a little bit of a perspective, right now we kind of have Western medicine on one end of the spectrum. And we have a lot of practitioners there that are fantastic at what they do. They're able to, you know, really have some innovative means behind figuring out what's going on with specific individuals. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have all of our holistic practitioners, and they are fantastic at being able to heal the body in a natural way. But right now, on both ends of the spectrum that are very far apart, there's currently nothing that really exists in the middle. And clients and patients are both feeling like they need to invest in all or nothing. So they have to be all in holistic medicine or they have to be all in Western medicine. And they don't really understand that you can have a blend of both of those worlds. Now, when we're talking about Western medicine, I mean, myself and the other nurses on our team by no means think that Western medicine is an issue. Western medicine is innovative and amazing and definitely helps save lives. I mean, if we get in a car accident or have a heart attack or cut our arm off, we're not going to rub some herbs on it and hope that it heals. We definitely need Western medicine in these times. But with that being said, we are taking too much of a reactive approach to health, and we need to turn towards more preventative, holistic means to be able to help individuals both avoid disease and then when it's presented, be able to heal and that means as well. So our company behind what we offer in terms of our services and our programs and working with clients is very much a customized approach. We help individuals bridge the gap between holistic medicine and and Western medicine, bring those two things together and figure out how they can manage their disease in a way that makes the most sense for them, being able to reduce or eliminate those symptoms and ultimately live that better quality of life to the best of their ability. Now, uh, you said you started your company six years ago. Uh, That's before the pandemic. So did you notice a surge in business when COVID cases were on the rise? And what kinds of questions were your clients asking? Absolutely. So I did start the company about six years ago, and it actually ended up about three years ago being rebranded under the Holistic RN, and then now the Holistic RN and company as I've started to add more nurses to my team. So I officially hung up my scrubs in the hospital just before the pandemic hit three years ago. And as we moved into the last couple of years, and of course, the unfortunate circumstances that we've all had to face, I wouldn't necessarily say that the surge in clientele that we've been seeing has been related to the high COVID cases, but more so that they are recognizing the impact of burnout of our frontline workers. They are going in for a doctor's appointment where they are only being seen for five minutes. Their concerns are not being seen or heard. They are being passed a prescription and walked right back out the door with none of what they're hoping to be you know, discussed or have their questions answered actually coming to the table. So in terms of the questions over the last couple of years, I would say it's more so been about How can they help their bodies in that natural way to be able to support their own system, their own immunity, and things like that as well? I mean, when we're talking about the immune system, 75% of our immune system is actually in our gut. So when we're talking about the importance of nutrition and eating whole foods and eating foods that our body specifically agree with, that is astronomically important. So it comes back to those questions being more so about that health variant and being able to approach this in the most natural way possible and what they can do for their own immunity. So as someone who is on the center of this really broad spectrum, which seems about as broad as like the political spectrum, what advice have you been giving to those who have been hesitant about getting a COVID-19 vaccine or maybe unsure whether they should get a booster? Great question. So I will be honest, we are not advising, coercing, or pressuring anybody into making a decision one way or the other. Our company very much stands behind the ability for individuals to choose what makes the most sense for them and be able to advocate for that decision. So we're all about providing education and information, both on you know the vaccine itself in terms of what are some of the potential benefits that they could see? What are some of the potential side effects? A big thing that's been missed over the last couple of years. And also educating on natural immunity and what their body can do. So we provide all of the information and then we help them make that decision for themselves and feel supported in that decision. So regardless of what end of the spectrum individuals fall on, they can feel supported and heard from our company specifically. And many people just have so many different thoughts on nutrition and healthcare and doctors and pharmaceuticals. How do you help individuals that are just overwhelmed with the abundance of and often confusing information out there? 
It's a great question as well. So you're absolutely right. It is super confusing. And, you know, if you were to Google anything out there and say, you know, why is this harmful or why is this beneficial? You would absolutely find a million answers to support that question. Mm -hmm. I mean, take dairy, for instance, a super controversial one that is so much, you know, yeah. red flags on either end of that. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, in regards to nutrition specifically, I mean, the body is so unique. We are built very differently. What works specifically for you and your body is not necessarily going to work for me and mine and vice versa. And so looking at each individual and figuring out what works specifically for them is a process called bio-individuality. Now, our company strongly believes that, you know, there is no right or wrong way to do anything. And when we're looking at each individual client, we're figuring out what works specifically for them and their body. So it's not about what's right and what's wrong, but more so what works for them, what feels the best to them in their life, and what does their body actually agree with? So there is a bunch of experimentation and, you know, trial and error in that process of working with your practitioner to figure out what actually makes sense for you. But it's navigating that confusing information to know that there really is no right or wrong answer, but more so what it comes down to for you in your life. Now, the past several months, Canadians have seen inflation hit record levels in recent years, and some have taken second and third jobs. Others are skipping meals in order to keep their heads afloat financially. And on top of all that extra work, stress is likely taking a toll on all of us. So what are some ways that we can stay healthy and balanced while keeping up with the runaway costs of living? It's a great question. So in regards to this, I mean, economy wise, there's not a whole bunch that we can do to get away from the current circumstances that are available to each individual. And stress is astronomical when it comes to the impact on our health itself. Our cortisol levels, which is our stress hormone, as soon as those begin to rise, the implications in the rest of our system definitely are impacted directly by that. I mean, every single system in our body is interconnected. So when we're talking about what individuals can do to be able to manage that stress and the rising costs and still take care of themselves, I always recommend starting slow and doing something, you know, to focus on and prioritize themselves every single day. So when we're talking about making steps and making changes, if you wanted to be able to improve, say, the food that you're eating to improve the health of your body, I would not recommend you go to your pantry, toss out all the food and buy everything fresh to start tomorrow. Instead, I recommend adopting the mentality and the idea of using something up and replacing it with a better option. Whether we're talking about our food supply, we're talking about, you know, beauty products, household products, or anything else that we want to start moving towards a more natural means of living and having in our own lives, using something up and replacing it with a better option is a slow approach. It's not so overwhelming. It's not so stressful. And it definitely is more financially supportive and doesn't create so much of an overwhelm in that sense. Now, here in southern Alberta, the city of Medicine Hat during the pandemic, they weren't hit by the pandemic so much as they were hit with a plague of male suicides. And so I want to talk about mental health for a bit because we, we, we touched on it uh, just a bit. Now, I've read that there's a link between mental health and gut health. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So I like to call our gut our second brain. And our gut has a huge impact in every single system, every single organ. And what we eat and ingest absolutely has an impact on our mental health. In fact, 95% of our serotonin, which is our happy hormone, is actually made in our gut, which a lot of people don't realize or understand. Mm, wow. So when we start looking at the food that's coming in and we talk about you know, the convenience food that a lot of us tend to reach towards in terms of the things that come in a bag or box and have more than one ingredient, those things are often filled with refined or processed ingredients that definitely aren't supportive to our best mental health. And when we take in these foods often and regularly, our body has a hard time keeping up with those toxins, can build a lot of inflammation, and over time, ends up ultimately creating havoc in other systems, including our brain, absolutely. So when we're talking about being able to improve that, one of the best things that you can do is being able to do some intolerance testing or sensitivity testing figuring out specifically what your body is saying yes to or no to, and then also being able to move towards eating more natural whole foods to the best of your ability as well, so you can reduce that inflammation and improve your body system automatically. Now, you said earlier that everything in our lives and in our bodies is interconnected, so we, we could eat healthy, we could drink plenty of water, exercise daily, but we could still run into health problems if we're not looking after another area of your lives. For example, we could be doing all that, but maybe we're not getting enough sleep or not setting time aside to relax. So 
Brian, what is the number one thing that you have noticed Albertans are lacking in? Oh, I don't know if I can pinpoint it, honestly, because like I said, it comes down to each individual uh, in terms of what their specific life is saying yes and no to. But we do have a concept called primary food that we like to focus on. And it's not actually the nutrition that's on your plate. And primary food actually references your lifestyle. So this actually incorporates 12 different areas, things like your spirituality, relationships, career, finances, home environment, all of those things. And I typically tend to find that most of the you know, issues that individuals are facing actually come from the primary food category and not from the nutrition or other pieces of their lives. And this is because we can eat as healthy as we want to, but if we're in a toxic relationship or a career we hate, ultimately we're still going to be open to the possibility of disease or other you know, unhealthy pieces of habits or whatever that might be. Now, we're almost out of time, but I want to squeeze in one more question for you because there are a lot of people, especially children, dealing with colds and flu bugs right now. And then supply issues with children's medications are causing emergency rooms and hospitals to fill up. What is your holistic recommendation to help both children and adults handle the flu season? Absolutely. So I definitely recommend if you have the ability to, to book an appointment, because as far as medical advice goes, we want to make sure that we're not providing any you know, general recommendations to the public and more so that they are able to get specified advice based on their own lives, conditions and concerns and things like that. However, some of the things that I recommend looking into are things like daily movement, uh, being able to get outside and get lots of adequate vitamin D levels. And if not, perhaps supplementation might be a good idea for you. Being able to pay attention to vitamins that your body needs, paying attention to that nutrition category and doing your best to eat whole foods and enough of them so you get enough nutrients for your system specifically. Staying well hydrated and even looking into some natural herbs as well that might be able to support your body in whatever you know prevention technique you might require. And you recently announced that your company is expanding and you're looking to actually hire 10 more registered nurses. And how can those in southern Alberta get in contact with your company? Um, are there staff in this neck of the woods? Absolutely. So we're not just actually hiring registered nurses, but we're also hiring licensed practical nurses as well. So our goal is to expand our team by 10. We're actually in the midst of completing over 70 interviews at this time. Our current clinic is in Stony Plain, uh, and we do have the, I guess you can say, focus and hope and desire to open four more clinics across Alberta next year, or this year, I guess I should say. So we're looking at Edmonton, Red Deer, Calgary, and Lethbridge for being our potential clinic spaces that are really opening. And it will just be dependent on our team members who actually end up coming through what those spaces will look like and where exactly they will be located in every city. But if they want to head to our website, theholisticrn.ca, they'll be able to follow our journey, join our mailing list and get in contact with us and know when those other clinic spaces are going to be open and when those team members will be able to provide those services. Well, that's excellent to hear. But that's all the time we have for today, Brian. We really appreciate having you on our show. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. Brian Roberge is a registered nurse, holistic health coach, blogger, recipe creator, and the founder of the Holistic RN and Company. Well, 2022 was a huge year for many of us, and I'm sure my next guest will agree. He released a new album, appeared in a new movie, performed on the Grand Ole Opry stage in Nashville, and collaborated with other well-known artists to bring light to the coal mining issue in Alberta. He's Alberta born and bred. I'm talking about Juno Award and Canadian Country Award music winner Corb Lund. Corb, welcome and Happy New Year to you. Hey, you too. Happy New Year. Yeah, so as I was mentioning all of your accolades, it didn't elude me that you're actually a multi-Canadian Country Music Association award winner, not to mention the numerous other awards that you've received. And in 2022, I believe you won another one for Alternative Country Album of the Year for songs yeah. my friends wrote, right? Yeah. So congratulations on that. That was your 11th album? Uh, something like that. I've lost track. <laughs> you've lost track. That one was that one was um, a fun one. It didn't take that long because it was, as as the name implies, it's called "Songs My Friends Wrote." So it's it's me and my band uh, interpreting a bunch of my buddies' tunes. Oh, that's so fun and that's so neat. And that, of course, also was released in 2022. It's a lot easier when you don't have to write the songs. Well, that's true. And I know, like, out of your other 10 albums, I think three of them are gold. So you've had many successes in your life, and of course, it was a huge year this past year for you. 
mixed with both success and, of course, personal loss. So, Corb, I want to start off by talking about a dear friend of yours who was also a Canadian legend, so Ian Tyson, who just passed away. And I'm so sorry for your loss, Corb. I know that he meant a lot to you. Yeah, he was a good friend. It's a big loss for everybody. We, we knew it was coming. he was getting toward the end of his trail and he went peacefully, so that's good, but big loss for sure. Yeah, so maybe tell me about him and how far did you two go back? Uh, I think I met him about 20 years ago. I was doing a, maybe more, I was doing a tribute show called The Gift where me and a bunch of people were doing uh, covers, of, like doing Ian Tyson songs in a touring theater show. And he came out to the Calgary show and I met him there. And since then we've... Uh, uh, recorded a bunch of stuff together and toured a bunch together and played lots of shows and tried to write some tunes together. And yeah, spent a lot of time with them. Okay, so was Ian an inspiration to you musically in some ways? Yeah, he was. He was. Um, he was uh, kind of a role model in terms of writing songs with Canadian references. It's hard to do that because if you write American stuff, if you're from America and you put Chicago or LA or Dallas into a song, it has built in resonance already and people kind of know what you're talking about. But for an international audience, it's much harder to, you know, put Calgary in a song or High River or something. And um, Ian figured out a way to do it, make it work. Like he did it in, in Four Strong Winds. That's probably the biggest, that's probably the most famous reference to Alberta in a popular international song. But yeah, he, he kind of approached it through a a geography cowboy kind of way which kind of made sense and i've sort of learned to do that too it's tricky it's tricky connect it's tr it's tricky um as like i said as a canadian songwriter to uh, connect with americans and international audiences um while still maintaining a connection to singing what about where you're from it's tricky it's harder and he was he was the best at it I can imagine how challenging that would be so uh, with that said what kind of an impact on Canadian music and Canadian culture did he have? Pretty big one. I mean, we kind of consider him our guy, but he was internationally huge too. Like, but but yeah, I think five or six years ago, they had a contest or a poll on CBC about the greatest Canadian song ever, and it was Four Strong Winds. So that tells you something. That, that, was a, that was a user poll, like a listener poll. And I think, um, I don't know, it's almost, that song's almost like a second Canadian national anthem, I think. <laughs> And then he's written a ton of songs. He's had different phases to his career. You know, he was huge in the folk scene in the 60s and then s sort of did some country rock stuff with Great Speckled Bird and then some Nashville records. And then in the early 80s, he was the he was the sort of the one of the leaders of a, a big renaissance in traditional cowboy music. And he's been doing that ever since. So he's had many phases and he's really good at all of them. That's amazing. Uh, what an inspiration. You two did you know, do you perform together? You did some shows together. So what was what was it like to be up on stage with him? That was fun, mostly. Like, after a while, I just sort of forgot about the his uh, professional track record, and he just became a buddy, kind of. It, it, it never felt like I was hanging out with somebody that was 30 years older. He always felt like any of my musician buddies. So mostly it was just fun. Okay, so switching gears here, this past year was a huge year for you, Corb. So you start in a movie, you got to perform live on the Grand Ole Opry stage in Nashville. So what was it like for you being up on that stage? Uh, it was kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> I, um, yeah, it's been a busy year. Uh, that's been so long ago, that was in April, I guess. But yeah, it was moving for sure. Um, they have a chunk of the old stage from the Ryman Auditorium a circle maybe six or eight foot diameter and it's from the old stage and it's all warped and worn out and they have that center stage so that's where you stand and you sing so everybody stood there you know hank and willie and waylon and everybody <laughs> so yeah it's, it was but it was good i my my storytelling songs work well in that format i think they like me <laughs> oh it must have been so humbling to be up there knowing that those those you know superstars stood on that very stage yeah it's a heavy thing for sure. So, the core, I remember, go remember ahead. The word. I said I remembered the words, so that's good news. <laughs> that's always good news. <laughs> okay, so, Corb, let's talk about your new movie. It's called Guitar Lessons. So, what's the movie about, and how did this all come about? Um, I'm, buddy, I'm buddies with the guy who wrote it and directed it. His name is Aaron, Aaron, uh, Aaron James. And um, we, I, I've done little bit parts in some of his older movies. And, um, yeah, he just came down to my house and leaned on me to do. I didn't really want to do a lead role because I've never done anything that 
that uh, challenging as an actor. I've just done little bit parts, but uh, he convinced me to do it. And I'm, I mostly did it because I liked the script a lot. It was a really cool story uh, about a northern Alberta community. It's a, it's a very Alberta story, very Canadian. And it's it's about me. I, I'm a I play a you know a middle aged successful oil and gas guy who used to be a, a hotshot guitar player whose career didn't work out, and so he's kind of bitter. And then this scruffy 14 year old kid starts hassling him for guitar lessons, and uh, I'm kind of a jerk at first, and then we become friends. And <laughs> happily ever after. Is it uh, art imitating reality? <laughs> Has this oh, ever happened to you? Friend. Yeah, it wasn't like I was playing a you know, a person with an accent and a limp or something. It was, it was pretty, you know, I'm pretty familiar with rig guys <laughs> and uh, oil oil and gas guys. And I mean, the, the music part wasn't too tough. So yeah, it was it was not a stretch. Uh, real actors can, can, you know, the really good actors like Dan Day Lewis and those guys can, can play people who are nothing like themselves, which is a whole nother thing. Oh, it's amazing. Not but yeah, it, it actually, it actually, it's kind of interesting because instead of filtering down from Hollywood down to the cities and then the towns, it's kind of gone opposite. We started having it play in small towns all across Alberta and then it filtered up to the city. And it's, I, I think it's, um, I think they're putting it out again as soon as some of the theaters empty out from, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Avatar. <laughs> so, um, and it also, apparently it was the most successful, like the, the most well-attended Canadian movie in Canadian theaters this year, which oh. is cool. Wow. Well, congratulations on that. It'll, uh, it'll, be, it'll be on streaming eventually, but they're still working that out, I think. I don't know much about the movie business. Okay, so do you think this will whole, open up a whole new world for you, acting-wise? I don't know. I like music too much. It takes a lot of time. Eh? I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm open to it if I, have, if I have the time, but I'm still trying to figure out how to play guitar properly. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a lot of work. So. so how long did it take to film? You, you mentioned it started filming in 2021, the end of it. Yeah, I, think, I, think about ten, I think it was up there about 10 days in high level. Okay. It's way up there. It's right by the Yukon border. Yeah. Oh, sorry, maybe, yeah, sorry, the Northwest Territory border. Right, yeah. Uh, long days, I would imagine. Some of them, yeah. Because yeah. you kind of, once the cameras are going, you kind of got to get it for you. For you. Sleep, so. Well, okay, so you mentioned that you're going to stick with music, <laughs> although you love acting because you've done other bit parts before. And I think I'm, not sure if I, I'm not sure if I love it or not yet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think um, live theater would be more fun because, like, in music, mm. making records is okay, and it's kind of fun, but playing shows, live shows, where you get the energy from the audience, that's kind of why I do it. And I feel like acting might be the same way. Like, making movies is kind of cool, but you do it, and then no one applauds or you don't know if it was any good. And then six months later you see it. Right. And people might pat you on the back then. Whereas live theater, it's the same as live music. It's, you can feel it. Right. Yeah. You get that immediate reaction. So I'd like to try that sometime too, but I, I need about five lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, you really do. I feel like you've lived five lifetimes already. Uh, even just like looking back on this past year. So early last year, you collaborated on a project with other well-known Canadian country artists. So, you know, we're talking Terry Clark, Paul Brandt, Brett Kissel to re-release your single called This Is My Prairie. And you all came together to do this to tackle a bit of a controversial topic, the Alberta government's proposal to rescind the province's longstanding coal mining policy. So that policy proposal, had, it had landowners and environmental groups and First Nation groups protesting it, not to mention you and your fellow musicians. So why were you so against this policy change? Um, well, I initially, it was brought to me by some, some ranchers who, who had generational places up in the foothills. And I always address this topic by saying, number one, I'm not against resource extraction. It's just that this is a terrible idea. And number two, I'm not political. I don't like any of the parties. So this has nothing to do with politics for me. I would say the same thing, no matter who is trying to pull it. But yeah, it makes no sense for Albertans. Like the, all we're getting, the, the royalty rate is very, very small, and all the companies are foreign, and it's going to ruin the water, it's going to ruin the Old Man River, and it's going to ruin the Rockies, and we don't get anything out of it other than a few hundred jobs per mine, which have to be balanced against ag jobs and tourism jobs, not to mention the cleanup, which no matter what they say, the taxpayer will foot the bill for. We know this. This is just, that's an old playbook, so. And the government's, in my opinion, it's hard to say, but my guess is they're going to try to... Uh, keep the ban in place on some of the areas, but allow it in other areas. 
and try and slip that by, but we're not going to let them as, as, as best we can. We're going to basically the position that we, I've taken and the people that I've worked with and the ranchers up there think that uh, we don't want any more coal mines in Alberta, period. Mm -hmm. so. Well, yeah, you've been very vocal about it. And so anything else like that on the horizon for 2023 in terms of collaborating with other musicians for a cause, so to speak? Oh, well, I don't know. This will be my last cause. It's a huge pain in the butt. Um, but uh, as far as collaborating, I don't know. I might end up writing a song or two about it because usually I end up writing songs about whatever's passing through my my consciousness at the time. If I'm doing a home reno, I write a song about that. If I'm playing cards, I write a song about that. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple of uh, songs in, in that vein coming out. But um, yeah, this I've realized that that this kind of topic is, or this kind of issue takes a long time. You don't fix it overnight because often the government and the companies try to drag it out so people lose interest and kind of sneak it in the back door. So uh, they've annoyed me so much that uh, that I'm not going to go away and neither is anybody that I'm working with on this until we have solid legislation in place to have no more coal mines. I'd like to, I'd like to repeat again that I'm not against all extraction of resources. It's just that this particular idea is real stupid. <laughs> all right. Uh, so with that said, what is on the horizon then for you this upcoming year, Corb? We talked about movies. Uh, what about Albums. You have another album planned, uh, touring. You pretty much outdid yourself in 2022. Yeah, since the smoke cleared after COVID in March, we, uh, we, we've been touring the whole time until Christmas, pretty much. I think we played most of the provinces in 38 states, I think, since, since March. So I'm pretty beat. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty much open. I'm, I'm home writing until May, I think. So, yeah, I'm trying to make a new record right now. I have to, to make a record, I have to have some downtime and read some books and chill out a little bit. Because I get ideas on the road, but it's just, they go, you don't have time to really develop them. I just write them all down. And then when I get home, I take a deep breath and try and put them all together. Yeah, exactly. And then try to process everything. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm so happy that you have some time to for, for some R&R &R in this upcoming year. It's, it's really a cool thing, actually, being able to... Uh, be from this area and and write songs about this region and sing them internationally because it that's a tough thing to pull off and we've been lucky enough to be able to do it but yeah i think i think i'm sixth generation albertan and we've been in southern alberta since the 1800s and it's it's really cool to to take our culture and put it into music and art and then take it up to the world it's pretty neat mm -hmm. yeah well this will give you some chance to get back into the mountains and do what you love to do get, get yeah. back on the back of the horse yeah and uh Chill out a little bit. Exactly. Well, I wish you the best in this new year, Corb, and congratulations, of course, on all of your recent successes. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a busy year. <laughs> Absolutely. That was Alberta born, Gina Award winning country music artist, Corb Lund. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.